Look out, something is going to get you tonight. Let's talk about the thing that's going to get you tonight. Welcome to the Happy Harvest Horror Show. <laughs> Welcome to the podcast. I'm Corey. And I'm Brian. And this is the Happy Harvest Horror Show, where every week we talk about spooky things and keep the spooky season alive all year round. And today we have a nice spooky holiday podcast for you. But first, you know it. We all know it. The spooky banter. (laughs) I I hope you're expecting it at this point. I hope you look forward to it because I know I do. I love catching up about this kind of spooky stuff. Your spooky week in review. Brian, how spooky was your week? I really built it up and it really wasn't that spooky. Um, <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> I was kind of pulling the, you know, loudest person in the room when they know the least. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's what I was doing. I was yelling. But uh, a lot of my spooky stuff was in preparation for today. I read a lot of Christmas ghost stories, uh, in particular, really just one Christmas ghost story. <laughs> Teaser. The Christmas ghost story to end all Christmas ghost stories. <laughs> exactly. Went back and reread and rewatched some of my favorite versions of it for research for today. I started, I think I mentioned last week, started American Horror Story Hotel. Um, I haven't gotten very far, but there's fun ingredients happening. I'm excited to keep going. Uh, what else? There, if you guys have Shudder, which I think you should by now. Uh, hi, Shutter. You should please sponsor us. Uh, please, <laughs> um, please, Shutter. Please. <laughs> there is a special on Shutter um, hosted by Joe Bob Briggs. He used to um, host Monster Vision on TNT back in the day, and he has since been resurrected on Shutter. And he hosts this show called The Last Drive In, where just kind of like the Monster Vision of uh, years past, he will show old horror movies. He's basically a horror movie host. So every quote unquote commercial break he'll interject with his own thoughts and all that he's just an old curmudgeon the ship at the show is pretty fun and he showed last week a double feature of deadly games which is a french basically predecessor to home alone which i had never knew <laughs> existed and then he showed christmas evil but there's a french precursor to pre- precursor home precursor alone. that's the word yeah it's <laughs> nuts <laughs> if i have to give any christmas gift to everybody it's go check out this movie i think it's called 3615 code pair noel okay if like a french precursor to home alone piques your ears i highly recommend going, going to watch this because it all takes place to this really rich kid who is basically home alone on christmas eve and he has all the toys and all the stuff he wants in the world. And he basically fashions himself as like this little Rambo who fights off like a crazy homicidal Santa that tries to break into his big mansion. All right. All right. Wild movie. Definitely check that out so we can talk about that. And then let's talk about how <laughs> there is no way that Home Alone was not made without knowing about this movie. But yeah, that's that's what uh, that was kind of the spooky stuff that I was up to. What about what about you? I don't really have too much, like, I feel like because we just did our little, like, Krampus catch-up a few days ago, so I there hasn't really been too much spooky stuff since then. I had a spooky dream last night that I was pregnant with five babies, so <laughs> that was... Five? Five. <laughs> So I woke up and that was like, oh boy, oh, like that was that was a bit terrifying. A Disney Channel movie, Quince. Yeah, <laughs> I loved that movie. Well, it's still sitting there in your subconscious, I guess. <laughs> I guess so. Yeah, and it was also I also I don't remember everything from the dream. I really, really need to get better about journaling my dreams when I wake up because I have a, an absolutely like batshit crazy subconscious. Like I have fucking wild dreams like every night to the point that like I don't remember the last time I had something that I would classify as a nightmare because like Mm. all of my dreams are insane so I'm it's just like I just wake up and I'm just like yeah of course you know like that might as well have happened (laughs) exactly exactly like I really don't remember the last time I was like shook by a dream because like they're all kind of nuts but last night's was actually to be honest it it wasn't like the scariest by any means but it was weird and there was like a um I, I was pregnant with five babies and I was still in college I was still in school 
Mm-hmm. And I was on a, I was on like the world's like craziest, like water slide roller coaster. Mm-hmm. It was like nuts because like it was so big that there were like stops on the water slide where you get out and you'd like walk through tunnels and you'd like end up in caves and shit. Jesus. And then you get back on the water slide. Mm-hmm. And so I was like navigating this crazy maze water slide thing and also dealing with the fact that I was pregnant and I had to like get my life together. It was how to get your life together for your five on the way kids. <laughs> it was wild. <laughs> Nuts, dude. That was probably the spookiest thing that's happened to me. Just general subconscious shit. I'm spooked, dude. But other than that, yeah, just uh, researching for today, which I don't know. I mean, like, obviously, I consider this topic spooky, but it also is probably, I mean, of all the topics that we've talked about so far, easily the most, like, heartwarming topic to me. This story that we're about to talk about means so much to me and it just like brings me so much joy i don't know i guess i don't i don't think of it as super spooky even though it definitely is Mm -hmm. but yeah in some way it's like a perfect distillation of what this podcast is like joy through spookies and that's what totally a christmas carol is (laughs) old curmudgeon gets spooked into loving christmas 100%. Since we started prepping for this episode, I watched my absolute favorite movie of all time, like three times um, (laughs) in the past like couple days. The Muppet Christmas Carol is my absolute favorite movie of all time. And it just, it never disappoints. And every time I watch it, it just something, it just lights up something in my soul. Like everything about this story, everything, exactly. It's the perfect combination of of everything i love about ghost stories and festivities and love and people taking care of each other and and personal transformation and just like (laughs) it's all there it speaks to me on such a deep level it is my movie completely so yeah so i guess in prepping for this episode has just been like a coming home, if you will. Like, it's been a very, like, comfortable, joyful time that also involves some spooky stuff. Because I think that's a, that's a good place to kind of kick off here is, like, it never registered to me that Muppet Christmas Carol was a scary story for a, for a very, very, very long time. Like, my entire childhood. Mm-hmm. Like, it didn't register to me that it was a ghost story. It just, like was the perfect story like i just didn't even think of it as like oh yeah i guess this is creepy you know (laughs) right and i feel like that's pretty common like i i don't know or maybe not that'd be interesting i guess it'd be interesting to do just like a poll or just like kind of like run up to people on the street and ask them if they think like you boy what day is it (laughs) it's christmas sir (laughs) It's not too late. Exactly. But just ask people, ask random people if they think that this is a scary story or a ghost story, if they'd like consider it a ghost story, you know? Well, I guess this kind of goes back to our conversation to Bly Manor that ghost stories don't have to be inherently scary. You know, ghost stories are many things just like this one can be scary. There's a lot of iterations that try to make it scary and a lot of iterations well, like I would argue Muppet Christmas Carol that is not so interested in scaring you. It is more interested in giving you a little spook. That's just a much bigger conversation of our... But also when you think about it, though, like Muppet Christmas Carol, I mean, I'd argue the target audience is all humans, but the target mankind. audience... <laughs> mankind, exactly. <laughs> right. But, but, you know, it's Muppets and the target audience is younger, right? It's mm-hmm. children. Mm-hmm. And like... From that perspective, the spooks are pretty scary, you know, like the Marley brothers in chains and you're in a friggin cemetery with basically like the Grim Reaper. Like that's scary. Like that's definitely frightening for a child. At least you would expect it to be right. I mean, yeah, all the iterations of Christmas future or Christmas that's yet to come are always a cloaked, hooded, silent imposing figure and so mm-hmm. that's always in my head I've been like yeah there's it's, a, it's supposed to be a spooky ghost story totally a little bit of the background a little bit of history right so 
in case you you happen to be unfamiliar with the Christmas Carol, I'm impressed, hey. <laughs> shocked, bewildered, even maybe even betrayed. I mean, I feel a little betrayed. I, I will admit. So it was published in 1843. The story was published in 1843. It's by my boy Charlie D. Charles Dickens. You know him. We love him. It was published mid 1800s. The heart of industrial England, basically. We're really at the the heart of uh, the Industrial Revolution and all of its problems, to yes. be honest. And it really captures the zeitgeist of that time. It captures that moment in time, as all Charles Dickens novels do. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I would be hard-pressed to find anyone that would that would automatically go to any other author besides Charles Dickens to describe like industrial England, you know, like that was kind of his thing. Like that's what he did. <laughs> Oliver Twist, Muppet Christmas Carol, like the, <laughs> or not Muppet Christmas Carol. <laughs> <laughs> it is just replaced Christmas Carol in your head. It's it always does. been Muppet. Okay. So like, I'm actually glad I did that because I was going to tell the story about the first time I actually read the story by Charles Dickens Mm-hmm. which I love. And it's such an easy read. Like mm-hmm. you really can sit down and read it, you know, every holiday season, if you want, like it's not a long book and it's, it's beautifully written. I really love the way Charles Dickens uses words. Yes. But the first time I read the story by Charles Dickens, I read it as the Muppets because the Muppet Christmas Carol is so deeply ingrained in my brain. So every time there was a line, that was like identical to a line in the Muppet Christmas Carol. My brain Mm. like read it as the Muppet versions. (laughs) I saw them all as the Muppets. I saw Scrooge as Michael Caine. I will never not see Scrooge as Michael Caine. He's a great Scrooge. Bob Cratchit is Kermit. Like there's no, (laughs) there's no getting around it. Like (laughs) so funny. (laughs) It's just how it exists in my brain. But they weren't around in the 1840s. So the story did exist before Muppets, I guess. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, it was published in 1843, and it was really this tale of bringing to light a lot of the the bullshit that was going on with the industrial revolution and Charles Dickens was kind of creating a, a sense of Christmas that was very charitable and very giving and very loving. And the interesting thing about the story that I think not a lot of people realize is that in so many ways, Charles Dickens, a Christmas Carol is responsible for modern notions of Christmas. Sure. Like before this came out, Christmas, I mean, it was not even a, a work exempt day that you still had to go to work on December 25th. It wasn't seen as a big deal. Exactly. It was, it was a minor holiday. It like was not this, this big thing that it is now. And in a lot of ways, and, and there have been historians that have kind of traced this, but the ethos of Christmas that like went on to develop into the late 1800s, into the early 1900s. And I think you can easily see a connection to even how we celebrate it today. It all started back with this story and the popularity of this story. One of my favorite things about this story was that it was published on December 19th, 1843. Every copy was sold out by Christmas Eve of that year. Wow. And then charitable giving skyrocketed that same year. Damn. That's a real life impact right there. Right? And it's just it's it's really beautiful. It's really beautiful that this tale like had that effect and and I think it's had an effect on countless numbers of people and how we view Christmas and what Christmas is supposed to be about. Another just kind of fun fact is that Dickens actually first conceived of this project as like a pamphlet that Mm -hmm. he planned on calling an appeal to the people of England on behalf of the poor man's child. Mm -hmm. And this is really interesting too about Charles Dickens. Like he, his father got arrested when he was young for not being able to pay back debt. Mm -hmm which was a very common thing in the 1800s. You'd go to debtor's jail. 
right. and he, he wasn't able to pay back debt. So he got arrested. And then so Charles Dickens as a child, as like an 11 year old boy, was put to work in the very classic Victorian England, terrible working conditions, you know, right. no labor laws for children. Yeah. And work was very scarce. You know, there was uh, the 1840s earned a nickname called the Hungry 40s. And once Charles Dickens got famous for Oliver Twist, he, you know, this wasn't something that was widely known about him because he wasn't really proud of it. But obviously, it uh, the treatment of the poor affected him on a very deep level. Yes. And so he wanted to do something about that. And the best way he knew how to do that was obviously through his art. And what I love about the fact that this was originally this pamphlet and then he decided to you know embody what he was trying to say into a story is just it's such a beautiful example and like perfect example of how art and particularly story really grabs people in a way that often theory or just information doesn't Right, right. I mean, who's to say like what would have happened? But I highly, highly doubt Charles Dickens' pamphlet would have reached the audiences <laughs> that the tale of A Christmas Carol has reached. Right. There are few stories in all of time that have reached the audience that A Christmas Carol has reached. Like it's one of the most well-known best-selling stories of all time yeah so i think it is it's just a really beautiful embodiment of taking a, a meaningful message what you're trying to say theoretically or trying to state about humanity and then putting it into a story and then it just has such an effect on people yeah. that literally lasts centuries you know but we're still getting new adaptations every year Right? It's wild. Stage, it's wild. television, movie. Yeah. Just its core. It's a beautiful tale that is meant to spark a sense of love for one another, a sense of giving, a sense of taking care of each other, mm -hmm. a sense of, you know, not looking down on your fellow man, a sense of what we have come to think of what Christmas is supposed to be about, right? Celebrating with people that you love, celebrating with family, celebrating with friends, celebrating with community, giving, 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 giving. All of these things were at the core of it, which is super beautiful. And to some degree, that's, that's why I have such just a lasting, intense love for this story. But also, you cannot talk about a Christmas Carol without recognizing that it is first and foremost a ghost story. Like I'll be visited by three spirits. Technically four, because Marley was one. It's true. Yeah, you it mean, is definitely you a ghost mean story. The Marley brothers? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean Jacob Marley. Get out of here with your Muppets. <laughs> We're Marley and Marley. <laughs> <laughs> That was another thing that totally happened to me. I was like shook when I found out that There's Marley one was Marley. one character. <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> like, no, it's ever one two of them. It's Marley <laughs> and Marley. Yeah, it is a ghost story. And, and it is all those things that you said just a minute ago of what this is and um, the goodwill that comes with it. And it's done through a ghost story that's meant to put up a mirror to yourself. You know, you have to, it, during this time of year, you're taking stock, you're, you're reflecting on your impact in the world and giving you the, like the keys of saying like, you're responsible. You know, this isn't like, you know, we're, we're preaching the goodwill, but it's not, the spirits aren't like saying you have to fix it. They're like showing him like you're being, you know, screwed. You've been an asshole and you can keep going on this path. You want, we're not forcing you to do anything. We're, we're giving you a chance to redeem yourself. And by being haunted, he it's, it worked. I'd love to see a version of Christmas Carol where like Christmas Eve night, Scrooge lays down to go to bed. He's visited by the first ghost, creepy ghost of Christmas past. And he's like awoken. And just the first thing, that the ghost of Christmas past says is like, Scrooge, you're being an asshole. <laughs> Dude, you're being a real dick here. Scrooge, you're come on. Come on. That's what I love about this story. You mentioned, I'd love to see a version of this. There are so many versions of a Christmas Carol, you yeah. know, that, that it's, 
it is such a perfect template that you could really fudge with the characters and what the spirits are, how they look and how they interact. Totally. And it all still works that you could put them through Muppets. And it's like, yeah, that, that, that works just as good. Exactly. Exactly. Like that is while, you know, Muppet Christmas Carol will always be end all be all for me. I also just stand this story as like a story of just like amazing integrity and amazing like it's just so well put together like it's Mm -hmm. and yeah the way it deals with archetypes right it's just like beautifully laid out and in a way that yeah i agree you could take it so many directions that would still work conceptually so well Mm -hmm. yeah and and that's part of you know why it's just such an enduring tale like why it just lives on and lives on and lives on in all these new incarnations i also wanted to before we get into some of the incarnations Mm -hmm. i wanted to talk about too something that i don't know that i really put together until honestly fairly recently like Mm -hmm. past couple years it is so interesting that this Christmas tale, this quintessential Christmas tale is at its heart a ghost story. It is Mm -hmm. 100% a spooky ghost story. But then you place it in the time in which it was made and like it all kind of aligns perfectly because Victorian England, as we've talked about, spooky place, they loved ghosts, man. Mm -hmm. Everything was ghosts. Even their Christmas stories were ghosts. To this day, all our ghosts are still Victorian ghosts. Exactly. And in the Victorian era is such an interesting time for the ghost story, for how we think about the ghost story, for just the fact that the ghost story really reigned during this time in in every way and in every facet of life, too. You know, it wasn't like a, a certain counterculture or anything it was like everyone had connections to ghost stories especially around christmas time it's tradition to have christmas ghost stories yeah yeah and and that's an interesting thing too is like there are there are tales like folkloric tales from a few different cultures i know one of them is irish but there are like folkloric tales that suggest that similar to halloween the veil thins on Christmas Eve. So the veil between worlds thins Mm -hmm. on December 24th as well, apparently, which was part of the inspiration, I guess, for Christmas Carol is this idea that, you know, the ghosts would be able to kind of get through to Scrooge on Christmas Eve night because Mm -hmm. the veil thins. And I was sitting there and thinking about that. And I'm like, oh, that makes so much sense because think back to your childhood, like think back to like Santa Claus, like how magical of a night is Christmas Eve? It's the most magical. It's so magical. Like you really do believe that anything can come through on that night. You know, you like magic can happen on that night. So it makes perfect sense that that would be a prime time for ghosts and spirits to come through as well. Spooky England, spooky Victorian ghosts. It's a spooky story. Yeah, I like what you said earlier. It it really embraces everything that this podcast is about, right? Yeah. Like celebration, goodwill, friendship, love, but like spooky as fuck you know like getting haunted and that like spooky's good it's a healing thing i I firmly believe that like it shakes you out of your you know your status quo it it rattles you a bit and that's good it's a good experience for us to be jolted into kind of being more aware of what's around us totally and i think that's something i mean we could probably do a whole episode on this but something you and i definitely share is our connection to spooky things and horror these things that we love to talk about there is a healing element in it for us Mm -hmm. like that's part of the attraction it's very therapeutic It is. It's therapeutic to just kind of dive in and face it. And like, and then you compound that by the magic of Christmas. Like, (laughs) they work so well together. It really does. It's really beautiful. The older I get, too, 
I, I not just spooky and ghost stories. This time of year is so perfect for ghost stories and for being haunted, you know, in a way that like when I was, a, when I was a kid, I, Christmas is so magical. I think for most kids, it's, it's, it's just a bright, warm presence, you know, cotton candy, not candy canes, not cotton candy. What kind of clown Christmas? Um, <laughs> what kind of clown Christmas? <laughs> what am I talking about? But it the older I get, it gets you know not to get sad, but it gets a little more haunting. You know that it, totally. that it changes in a way, and that's what a good ghost story is. You're haunted by things in the past, and, and maybe that's why we everyone's got their own iteration of a Christmas Carol everywhere because everyone gets to that age where they're like, "Hold on, I got some things to say." You know, I'm 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 going through this radical new uh, feeling during Christmas that's not so radical. It was happening for literally 178 years now <laughs> what how old is this story? yeah a, a long time yeah, yeah i think i think you 170 yeah that sounds about right um <laughs> yeah and also like winter you know winter is a very haunting time mm-hmm. by nature and it's a good time i think to celebrate these things and to you know to face them and to welcome them yeah there is definitely a haunting element to winter in and to christmas and i guess interestingly i've always found christmas to be a really solid mix of the two even when i was a kid so maybe that's why i was always so attracted to christmas carol Mm -hmm. like Uh, even as a a small child, I really loved both sides of it. Like, don't get me wrong. I loved the magic and the warmth and the Santa Claus, but like I, I vibed with the spooky and like the, you know, the haunting winter days as well. Right. There's room for both. Like the, the lovely sunshiny days where you get to go sledding and eat Christmas cookies are fantastic. But also, yeah, the like quieter, colder, creepier winter days have their own beauty to them. And I think all of that is at play with Christmas. So I'm really on board for this folkloric idea of like the veil thinning on Christmas Eve. Mm -hmm. I think that's super cool. Mm -hmm. Same. Let's take a quick break and then we'll come back and we can talk about just some of our favorite versions and maybe get into the the three ghosties. Yeah, do it. We have returned. Welcome back. We're talking Christmas Carol. Christmas Carol, which if you didn't know, is first and foremost a ghost story. Yeah. Don't forget it. You let them know. You let all those haters know. Uh, are there any like anti Christmas Carol haters out there? Like, I'm, I'm sure like, there are. I'm, I'd like to run into one. That would people be that are just <laughs> that hate mainstream joy, you know? <laughs> yeah, that is real. That is, that is real. real. You know? Oh, Christmas Carol. We get it. Yeah. <laughs> Do you? I think we need another adaptation because I don't think we fully get it yet. <laughs> Um, let's talk about, uh, some different, different versions, some yeah. different movies. We talked, we've already talked about Muppet Christmas Carol, and I'm sure you could have your own podcast to talk only about Muppet Christmas Carol. <laughs> I could. <laughs> I could talk about Muppet Christmas Carol forever. I could just recite Muppet Christmas Carol to you right now if I wanted to, but mm-hmm. I won't, mm-hmm. I won't do it. But you could. I don't know. Where do you want to start? We, uh, I guess we talked about Muppet Christmas Carol talked about i watched today a fun Mm -hmm. movie that isn't technically an adaptation of uh christmas carol but Mm -hmm. it is kind of a version it is the man who invented christmas have you Uh, seen this uh maybe i i know the title i'm trying to put the images to the head tell me more about it okay the man who invented christmas is currently on hulu and it's got um homie oh, this is the from, Charles Dickens. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, with Dan Stevens. Yeah, homie yeah. from Downton Abbey. Yep. I never saw it, but I know of the movie. It's fun. I watched it today and I was like, this is this is fun. It's kind of like silly, but like in a good way. It tells the story of Charles Dickens writing Christmas Carol. Mm-hmm. Right. And it's somewhat fictionalized, but also, you know, based on truth as Many movies are, <laughs> as many, many historical movies are. Based on but, a true story. 
Yeah, no, it's 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 a mix of both, but it tells the tale of Charles Dickens writing Christmas Carol and kind of what he was going through in his personal life. And then as he's writing it, the characters actually come to him like in the movie, like as he's Uh, coming up with Scrooge, like Scrooge materializes and like he has conversations with Scrooge. And the same thing happens with the ghosts, like the ghosts materialize. It sounds fun. It is. It's a fun combination of telling the story of how Charles Dickens came to write the story and then integrating the elements of the story into it. And it also tells things about Charles Dickens past. Like I mentioned, it goes into how he, you know, worked in factories as a child and his issues with his father and, Mm -hmm. and why he feels very, passionately about he's he's very against like debtors prison and like he feels very passionately about people who are less well off and he 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 definitely wants to speak out for the impoverished and yeah i i thought i thought it was cool i thought it was a cool way to tell the story not necessarily telling the story of christmas carol like it's not an adaptation necessarily sure but it's going a little bit deeper into how Christmas Carol came to be, which is de- is very up my alley. Like I love learning how stories or artworks or whatever came to be the thing right. that affected people. Yeah. Ultimately I would recommend it. I also liked that it wasn't just like this historical narrative that just kind of said what happened with Charles Dickens. Like it was, it was such a solid mix of the two. So I would really recommend that for sure on Hulu. Cool. Yeah. It's good to know that it's on Hulu. I remember it came through and I missed it, but it also like focuses on the spooky elements. Like it goes into how, when he was trying to figure out what he was going to write, like he kind of had writer's block, you know, and he didn't know what his next story was going to be. And Mm -hmm. there's like the scene where, the nanny of his children she's like telling them a ghost story and he like Mm. walks in on her telling them a ghost story and i really loved that because it really emphasized how integral ghost stories were to that time period and then there's scenes where he's talking to the nanny about her ghost stories and like he he actually confides in her a lot about the story because she's so into ghost stories Sure. I also really love that it emphasizes that Christmas Carol is first and foremost a ghost story. <laughs> <laughs> I also, in my research, learned that Charles Dickens was the father of nine children. Yeah. So, Jesus. Yeah. Jesus. Thinking of some other iterations, movie-wise, I kind of liked, I mean, I, I, I liked it because it was a kind of a tradition at my dad's house where he had a 3D TV. He was very proud of it. And he had the, the Disney Jim Carrey animated oh, yes, um, Christmas yes, yes. Carol. He had this 3D TV. It was the one 3D movie that he had. But we would watch that. So I have a, I, I liked Jim Carrey's performance in that. I think that was... I think that's a fun one and kind of spooky too. I love when they go spookier on the darker side. I always love that. Mm -hmm. All these iterations over the years, I'm like, I want one that just goes full on spooky. And we got a lot of that last year. Did you see Guy Pierce's A Christmas Carol? On It was on FX. It was like a BBC and FX joint production. So it's currently on Hulu. Yes, it's on Hulu now. Yep. And... (laughs) I started watching it. It's dark. Yeah, I'm definitely going to watch the whole thing. I'm 100% going to watch the whole thing. But I started watching it earlier today. And I got mm-hmm. like 15 minutes in. And I, uh, I I stopped it. And then I put Muppet Christmas Carol on. A lot of people really didn't like it. It really wasn't that I it. didn't like it. It wasn't a didn't like it thing. It was just like, I just remembered who I am. And I like sure. needed to watch Muppet Christmas Carol. <laughs> Like, I, I just can't not. I can't like I I love Muppet Christmas Carol so much. I just like in watching it, I just wanted the Muppet version. And so I was like, so funny. fuck it. See, when I usually see these stories, I'm like, man, what you could go so, so gnarly with this. And yeah, totally, totally. <laughs> yeah. Totally. And this one, what I also loved about this one, uh, if if you if you're looking for like you 
sound like you're looking for a Muppet <laughs> version of this story. Always. If you're looking for like a warm, you know, Christmas goodwill towards men, heartwarming sort of version of that's your ideal Christmas Carol. Uh, you're not going to find it in this one. <laughs> this one's p- <laughs> pretty fucking bleak. Um, this is not the it's place. It's <laughs> not that. But I, there's, th- there's parts of me that I really love about this though. I mean, it's, it's, it tries to go dark and gritty and it's, and it's Scrooge played by Guy Pierce in this one is pretty irredeemable. Like he's, he's a real fucking asshole in this one. Real piece of work. Real fucking piece of work. But what I love about this and what I, I think there's a lot of really cool aesthetics and, and the, the versions of the ghosts that show up are really, really haunting. But what I love most is he's, he's not just this old curmudgeon. He's just this grumpy old dude that likes to save a month, a penny, you know, he's an actual villain. I think we've been distilled this story of Christmas Carol so many times that people are like, Oh yeah, yeah. Just give to the poor. But you know, we're, we're totally being told the same lesson and, and this kind of like, I, I think, pretty false belief that you can just change on a dime you know that like one spooky night and suddenly i'm the father of christmas whereas this story the ghosts are trying to get him to say no this is not about forgiveness this isn't even about you at all this is about you needing to just get on the path of trying to be better you know which i think is which is sad to say but in this world is a much more realistic goal you know i than- want to make like merch that just says one spooky night and i am the father of christmas <laughs> That's that's what it is, right? I know, I know, but it's such a good line. Like, <laughs> just one spooky night, and I am the father of Christmas. That's all it takes, and he kept Christmas in his year in his heart all year round. It's not, it, but that's not going to happen to like these, you know, politicians and investment bankers and all these people in our real world. You know, totally. What can happen is putting this mirror and showing this is the harm that you've done. So, humanity and the path of getting better isn't you looking to get anything from it you know that this isn't about getting forgiveness or making excuses or seeking to repent it's to make it better for the people you've already harmed without expecting anything back like a true penance yeah yeah what i also love about this version too is jacob marley is an integral character because he he bears the chains that he forged in life, but his, his fate is also linked to Scrooge in this story. And so he can't receive penance unless Scrooge changes. It, it's furthering this idea that you're responsible for your fellow man, and it's not just about you. And that I think there's a lot of really cool things that are happening. It's also so bleak, it's so dark, and it's so slow that I think a lot of people were kind of put off by it. But Totally, totally. No, it sounds... That makes sense to me. And I do, like, I I promise you, I didn't dislike it. I was like, I want to watch this. Like, I I loved the aesthetic of it. Yeah, it's it's beautifully produced, yes. Beautiful. Like, and I was, like, into it. But, but yeah, it's just the fact of the matter is, like, when my absolute favorite movie of all time, it's just, like, a different version. It's hard. It's hard. Like, I'm like, oh, I just want to be singing the songs from Up at Christmas Carol right now. No cheesies for us, Mises. But just you talking about it, that sounds very up my alley as well. You know, I love I love those like dark stories that really get to the heart and the reality of it. Cause cause yes, mm-hmm. the likelihood of <laughs> one night of being haunted and then becoming, you know, the father of Christmas. It, it just doesn't really work that way. Like transformation right. doesn't happen that way. So I'm very in to that concept. And like, I know I will watch it and I think I will appreciate it for its own thing. It also doesn't surprise me that it didn't read well with a lot of people Mm-hmm. because ultimately on some level the reason that this story has literally lasted like the test of time is because mm-hmm. of its hopeful nature right yeah and that was actually something i was texting a friend today as i was watching a muppet christmas carol for like the third time in the past like <laughs> right. 36 hours um <laughs> and i was like this movie still brings me such joy, even in 2020. Yeah. And there is something powerful about that, right? Like, and and that doesn't mean there's not value in, in a more, a darker, realer approach. Like, I totally think there is. But I also think sometimes 
sometimes there is a, a lot of power in just a really joyful, hopeful story. Sure. It can invigorate the soul in in a really beautiful way. And I think that's why I get like so emotional about this story is because it can and it did like even just the fact like the historical fact that it was published and that same year within a week of when it was published like charitable giving like went up crazy amounts right it did have a tangible result in the world and right. to some degree i think just hope and joy can have a tangible result in the world. Yeah. And I think the opposite is also true that, that uh, showing things is, is kind of, they really are is, mm-hmm. is that's why we love horror. You know, you're actually, yes. you're not distilling it. You're, you're actually heightening it, you know, in a way of, of therapy that I, I think this, it's a great story. It's a perfectly perfect template, you know, that you can yeah, have any yeah, sort totally. of variation on it. I think there was just some merit in also having this one, because I feel like in all, if, if, all these versions of a Christmas Carol, the worst man on earth is just an old dude, you know, the old grumpy Michael Caine, you yeah. know, like that, that that's not real for me. You know, I'm like, yeah, I can imagine Michael much Caine worse. Will never be the worst man on earth. That exactly. Will never exactly. So like, Michael so, Caine is my grandfather. Like, right. Michael right. Caine is, yeah, never, never, never. No, I totally, totally agree. And that is, I agree. The beauty in the story is that um, it allows because of the template, it allows for that paradox to exist. Right. Like mm-hmm. we can look at both extremes and they can both exist and they can both have an effect. And I, right. yeah, I, I think that's wonderful for sure. Love this story. Love the spooky ghosts. And I love, love that it. we have all these options and, you know, that having just one version that's like this doesn't mean it's all the other versions are, you know, invalid. Or yeah, whatever. no. And I totally agree. Like, like I said, my instinct honestly is, I don't know when people kind of shut something down in mass or dislike it in mass, my instinct is definitely to lean harder into it. Sure. So like, even you just telling me that I'm like, well, <laughs> the, I'm uh, like a big fan of this movie now. Yeah, like, the oath of the, uh, the horror like, fan. All like, the critics hated it. Well, she says, well, I love it even more now. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And my instinct is whenever massives push back against something, it's like typically my instinct says to me that people just weren't willing to take enough time with it, you know, and like really Mm -hmm. sit with it. And it sounds to me like this version that you're talking about, is just, it's a, it's one you sit with. It's one you, you go deeper with. Yeah. And it's not for everybody and that's okay. And you know, that's where also what we think, but what else, what other iterations that you liked? I mean, I do love, I, I mentioned it before, but I love the original book. Like I really do. It's, it's a beautiful read. So like, yeah, it's great. If you're more of a reader. Just like read the book. It's so I got good. A beautiful. I mean, it's technically a novella, right? Yeah. That's yeah, what yeah. It is. It's, a yeah. T- it's a tiny it's, little book. <laughs> it's a very tiny book. I got from Barnes and Noble a number of years ago. It's, it just does, you know, Barnes and Noble does their like really pretty leather bound, you know, yeah. gold foil. I have like a red and gold foil, just little novella of Christmas Carol. Lovely. Just, it's just, it's beautiful to hold. I'm holding it now. Well, I imagine you um, in a Christmas sweater, like yep. sinking into a recliner. You're mm-hmm. wearing glasses, even though you don't have glasses. <laughs> that, that's sitting at the, the end of my nose. <laughs> I do have Christmas candles burning. That, that is also true. And uh, this is our Happy Harvest Horror Show, QVC. I'm holding here the Barnes & Noble Christmas Carol book. <laughs> how about we... How about we talk about the ghosts? I want to talk about each sure. ghost. Let's start with uh, all four, right? We're going to start with Marley. Okay. Okay. I I was going to do the three, but yeah, we should talk about Marley. You're right. Marley's kind of the spookiest one. Yeah. And by Marley, you mean Marley and Marley. <laughs> I mean singular Marley. <laughs> Swear to God. Definitely see Marley as a pair of uh, greedy, uh, cantankerous brothers <laughs> <laughs> yeah but i will you know just going to both the, the both the story the original charles dickens story and you know the muppet iteration i like this the scene where scrooge is visited by mm-hmm. marley like that's terrifying that's classic haunting that's a ghost yeah. story yeah for real like even down to you know all the little um details of like 
Victorian era Ebenezer Scrooge. He's like eating his like bread and cheese late night by the fire. He's and- by the fire. Like it's creepy. And then you have Marley in chains, like in chains. Yeah, definitely. And he's wailing. <laughs> yeah yeah like pretty classic classic ghost behavior for sure yeah this year this is textbook ghost also of all the ghosts obviously marley is the ghost of a person that was part of scrooge's life which is is also different from the rest of the ghosts this is an actual you know you're being visited like a haunting you're being visited by a ghost of someone who had passed, which yeah. is very central, I think, to the Victorian era ghost narrative, mm-hmm. right? And we can go very deep into this, but why ghost stories were so prevalent at this time is just people died a lot. Like you had a lot of death for v- a variety of reasons. Um, including, you know, plagues and just poor living conditions. And so, like, people were dying a lot. And so ghost stories kind of arose in relation to that, right? And when it comes to ghost stories, I am not a skeptic, nor am I, like, gung-ho believer. I'm, like, kind of in the middle with ghost stories. I believe that a lot of people probably were visited by something. But I also think these stories are representative of grief in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. So Marley in Christmas Carol is that classic Victorian ghost story, right? Yeah. Like you're yeah. being visited by someone from your past. Agreed. Agreed. I've always felt a little bad about Marley in a way because it was, it was Scrooge and Marley. They're partners in this. And yet Marley gets the, you know, the short end of the stick and <laughs> is kind of trapped and dangling changed all purg- you know, forever. And you got Scrooge, he gets a chance, you know? So I wonder, I would love an iteration where, or maybe there is one out there that I just don't know about where Marley goes through the same three ghost thing and he fails. And so, this is like him trying to appeal to Scrooge in a way. Yeah. That 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 just always kind of stuck with me of like, well, why why does Scrooge, you know, get a chance get this and, and Marley never did. Yeah. Yeah. Very true. But yeah. Why does Scrooge get a chance at redemption? No, totally. Totally. Maybe yeah. that's why I because I <laughs> Because I think of Marley as two people, I don't. Th- I don't think of it as tr- as tragic because, like, they have each other. <laughs> <laughs> At least we're dangling these chains together. <laughs> it's not so heavy with you. And they seem to be having a good time. So, like, <laughs> they're laughing a lot. Oh man. Ghost of Christmas Past. Okay, dude, Ghost of Christmas Past in several iterations. So creepy. And it's always like a young girl, like a young, creepy ghost girl. Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes a flame, a little ghost girl flame. I think there can be an argument to be made of the Ghost of Christmas Past being almost creepier than Ghost of Christmas Yet to Come. Mm -hmm. Because- yeah. This Ghost of Christmas yet to come is kind of to be expected, but Ghost of Christmas Past is just like, what the fuck? Like, yeah. <laughs> who is this creepy, fluttering ghost girl that wants to take me into the past? Like, what? That's definitely the scariest ghost in a Muppet Christmas Carol, for sure. Oh, that, yeah. like, Super uncanny weird. little puppet ghost. Yeah, not okay. <laughs> Her face is so weird. But that's also, so like I said, I got kind of, you know, I started the Guy Pierce version. Mm-hmm. And the isn't the ghost of Christmas past also a girl in that one? No, it's I actually really love the ghost of Christmas past. It's, it's mm-hmm. Andy Circus, And he's like, oh, this almost Father Christmas. And you meet him with Jacob Marley going like, through seeking his penance and it's in this field of discarded Christmas trees and Ooh. and he is throwing on a big fire just all these there's all these abandoned toys and all these cr- Christmas trees of the past that he's just throwing on this big fire and he with the help of he like he's the ghost of Christmas past but he also like employs ghosts of Scrooge's past that at one point, like his his father comes in. He's, he's a really abusive father in this iteration. Alibaba is another one that comes in because it was from Arabian Nights. The story he's read as a kid is like only friend 
at school. So like it goes to Christmas past. It's a lot of different things in this story. And I think that really works. It must be the man who invented Christmas then. The ghost of Christmas past is also just like a creepy young girl. Yeah. A diff- you know, different than Muppet Christmas Carol version. But and I feel like I've, I've just seen seen that done multiple times before. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it's just it's haunting. Like it's, you know, Very it's haunting. that like haunting, weird feeling that you get from Ghost of Christmas Past. And not to mention the fact that like you're also that ghost takes you into the past. So like mm-hmm. that's terrifying in itself. Like you're dealing with time travel at that point and like mm-hmm. other dimensional reality. So yeah, there's something just very otherworldly about Ghost of Christmas Past, I feel like. Yes. Agreed. Agreed. Ghost of Christmas Present is I want to invite him to my Christmas party. Like he's just <laughs> just a good time. Like yeah. like all yeah. around. It's hard not to love Ghost of Christmas Present. And that's like, I feel like a pretty across the board thing too. Like um, the original story, the way Ghost of Christmas Present is illustrated is Mm -hmm. now very similar to the Muppet version. Like this large, jolly man. I'm pretty sure he has red hair even in the... At the beginning he does. Yeah, right. But just like, just joy incarnate, which I think is really interesting because mm-hmm. got his big cup yeah when thinking about the concept of these three ghosts and how they're connected to time i love that the joyful happiness incarnate ghost is the ghost of christmas present right because like right. isn't that always like the go-to like find presence like be present be in the Live moment that's where you find joy and like it's true. Like, it's not, you know, people don't say it for no reason. Like, like right. there is truth in that. So I think it's um, just very fitting that Ghost of Christmas Present is just this, yeah, this kind of jolly man who just loves to dance and eat and, like, here for a good time, not a long time, you know? <laughs> Highlight, yeah, not a long time, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. <laughs> exactly and that's uh, that they were all tragic and haunting figures but this one just you were watching in real time how brief his time is you know that I know. He, throughout just this christmas oh. present he starts off as this big jolly in some iterations big jolly spirit and by the end he's decrepit and dying and yeah. because because the present is fleeting. Exactly. But yet he's like, okay with it. Uh, Ghost of Christmas present is so good. Yeah. He's just here and until he's not, you know, and it's right. like, damn. <laughs> yep. Uh, um, I'm going to cry. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, that's, that leads us into the next, uh, maybe the most famous, I think of all the, the ghosts, even though it has, the least to say never speaks the ghost of Christmas yet to come because we can never know the future. He doesn't need to speak. Like, you know, what's it's going on. Just, that's the scariest thing about him. He just points and you're like, Ooh. <laughs> oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus Christ. Tiny Tim. No. Yeah, definitely. The most, just in terms of imagery, the most classically spooky, oftentimes a Grim Reaper. Just a figure. big Dementor. Really? Yeah, yeah totally. A Grim Reaper ish ish figure and you know the kind of culmination of uh, scrooge's spooky night is he Mm -hmm. ends up in a graveyard and uh is faced with his own tombstone yep and Mm -hmm. it's like oh fuck um so ultimately i think maybe this is also a very big reason why i love this story so much is um Ultimately, Christmas Carol is a big tale of like memento mori. You are going to die. die. Mm -hmm. Like, do not Mm -hmm. forget you are going to die. Like, because that's where you get led astray. If you um, not only and and this actually goes back to the the story of Charles Dickens and him writing the story. Not only remembering that you will die, but also remembering like everyone else will die, and Mm -hmm. like that is our shared humanity. Yeah, we're responsible for our fellow man. Exactly, and that's where you can find that like shared humanity if you find yourself astray, like Scrooge. You know, like mm-hmm. coming back and remembering that like you are going to die, and so is everyone else. Yeah, we're all 
literally in this together because we all end up in the same place the ground <laughs> yeah the ground <laughs> i mean if if that's if that's your choosing resting place yes <laughs> <laughs> that is the culmination of this earthly life right yes yep. and so if you get too lost in th- things like money or things like these earthly desires to the point that you've like lost your humanity like it doesn't matter because you're going to end up in the same place as everyone else you know if you find yourself much like scrooge in a place where you're looking down on someone because they have um, less wealth than you well like jokes on you because like you're gonna die the same way that person's gonna die you know so right strewn into the story it's not only this like Scrooge, you're going to die. Like, that's terrifying. Like, it's not that. It's like a a way to incite this memory of like, well, this is where we all end up. And that's part of the beauty of it. I mean, I think that's probably a huge reason why I love this story so much, too. It's like a giant tale of memento mori. Yeah, 100%. I was in, you saw, I was in a, a production of Christmas Carol. I was going to bring that up. Yeah, an actress theater of Louisville. I, it was, you know, a part of the rite of passage when you were an apprentice there, you had to work on the show. But they had very cool ghosts in that one. The Christmas future was like a huge, out of the blackout, you don't realize that the curtains have opened and these big hands come out and encapsulates everything. And it makes me really like... I would love to see a production and I'm sure it's been done because it came to my mind. It's in the collective consciousness. Someone else has had heavy (laughs) idea before, but like to to have like a stage production of a Christmas Carol where the actual full on curtain of the stage becomes the ghost. Ooh, that would be cool. Where it just drops, you know, and then it like catches and it becomes like this figure. Oh my God, that'd be so haunting. Oh, I know it's happened. So if anyone knows that it's happening, because it has to have, I can't be the only one that's thought of this. Let me know because I want to see pictures. Maybe that's your destiny. Maybe you're supposed to make it happen. Okay. Well, if it's up to me, no one else steal it. Well, then in that case. (laughs) Well, no, you listened. We have the receipts. Just like Home Alone, you're going to steal it. (laughs) I remember, yeah, I came and visited in, I think like late November, I came and visited... Uh, in Louisville, Kentucky. Louisville, Kentucky. Louisville, <laughs> which is a lovely place. I had a really nice time. Great theater. Um, and yeah, you, you, I was, I was stoked to see you. And my favorite story of all time. It was, yeah, there were no Muppets. Yeah, uh, that was a bummer, but, but it was still very good. <laughs> in that production, the Ghost of Christmas Past uh, was done by an aerialist, which I thought was that was pretty cool. Her costume is. It's like a, from head to toe, like a flame. And she's pretty neat. Um, what other other? So these are all the ghosts. Do you have any favorite ghosts out there? Like adaptations of ghosts and any that come to mind that haven't, we haven't talked about yet. I, you keep asking me these questions and like, you know what my answer is. Muppets. Be. Okay. I, I want to get, <laughs> I want to go deeper. There's been 3 million adaptations of a Christmas Carol. There's gotta be something else. <laughs> How about you answer the question? Right. What has been your favorite ghost adaptation? Yeah, we, we've we've talked a few of them. There was a fun adaptation in comic book form called Batman Noel, which t- tells the Christmas story where Batman, he's Scrooge, and um, all the different ghosts are people from his past. It's a, it's it's pretty fun sort of retake on it because he's going through this night. And there's like Bob Cratchit is like a, a reluctant sort of criminal that's been working for the Joker, but he's just doing it to put ends meet on his on this kid's table tiny tim <laughs> and batman goes throughout this night learning you know that like hey they're doing these things for a reason they're not just all inherently bad what else um i'm trying to think of now my favorite scrooges that comes out more than the ghosts which is surprising i think michael keaton uh not michael keaton michael kane michael i was keaton. like my batman <laughs> uh, no michael kane is great always there was a 1984 tv version of this movie with george c scott i think he was just such an incredible actor he was in exorcist 3 and another great ghost story the changeling um i just think he was such a good actor so um looking that up it's i watched it earlier today on youtube just his performance and i thought that was really good jim carrey's is pretty fun in animated form yeah i don't know it's all good christmas carol's fun guy pierce is a real asshole in his which i think uh few scrooges are true 
dicks, you know? Mm -hmm. Fully just uh, devoid of a soul. Exactly. They don't like... I look at a Michael Keaton, I'm like, it's in there somewhere, Michael you know? Kane. You said it's Michael Keaton again? <laughs> Damn. Just got Beetlejuice on the brain, dude. I don't know. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, exactly. Michael Caine is... You can definitely always see the soul in him. That is also part of, to be fair, part of the original Charles Dickens tale, though. Mm -hmm. Like... And this is going back to watching The Man Who Invented Christmas, but he, the original, like when he, before he like published it, when he was still like finishing it up, he was going to write it to where like Scrooge wasn't really redeemed the way he was in the end. Mm. And, and then he kind of had a moment of like, no, like Scrooge needs to be redeemed. And like the idea is Scrooge helps save Tiny Tim and Tiny, but Tiny Tim saves Scrooge, you know? Yeah. The, decision to make Scrooge a redeemable figure is part of the hope of the story. Yeah. It needs some sort of hope, you know, that, yeah. that things can change, that we're not exactly. just damned in our choices already. Exactly. Because yeah, if it was just that this rich man's a bastard, like then that's, a, that's not a very like great Christmas story. <laughs> <laughs> but he is a bastard, you know, <laughs> Going back to the timelessness of the story, is it ultimately is a tale of humanity on all levels, right? Like it's yep. Scrooge's humanity, but it's everyone's humanity. It's Tiny Tim's humanity. It's Bob Cratchit's humanity. It's like, it's the humanity of everyone in the tale. And I think that's so important. I don't know. Like, I mean, it's, it's important at a time like right now, you know, like it's, it's important to, to find that in each other. It's always important. It's always important. And um, and if it takes a night of getting haunted to get you there, well, then, by golly, that's what needs to happen. <laughs> Listen, this is what's going to happen. This is what's gonna, if it works, it works. Exactly. Broke, maybe that's it. what we need more of. I Maybe we just need, we need some more fascist getting haunted. Like... <laughs> What do you think we're here for? Like, what, what is this whole genre here for? <laughs> it's some sort of cosmic punishment, you know? Like, right? totally. oh man, if we can't do it, the ghosts can. I also, speaking of damned and, and, and bad people, they're um, not bad people, good person. I, I, in my research of Christmas Carol, I remembered that in the, the final arc of Hellboy, when he goes down to hell and has this reflection of his life in, in hell, there is a... Um, little puppet show going on in the empty streets of uh, pandemonium that is doing a Christmas Carol. And that is Aww. like, and it is such a genius sort of guide through the, these last issues of Hellboy and that this that the culmination of his story and it goes through literally ghosts you know he's guiding through like his his purpose and what he his time is meant and what he still has to do you know mm -hmm. is just it's at the heart of a Christmas Carol as well and I think just as a literary story Hellboy in Hell is so fucking good not very Christmassy but it's very good <laughs> Yeah, so that's, that's yeah. A Christmas Carol. We didn't go through um, uh, not Chippendale. What are the ducks? Uh, the oh, Scrooge McDuck. Scrooge McDuck. Yeah, mm -hmm. didn't talk about him. We also didn't talk about like Dolly Parton's Smoky Mountain Christmas Carol. Oh, I'm watching that tonight. <laughs> yeah, set in the 1930s in the Smoky Mountains of East Tennessee. Hell yeah, I love Dolly Parton so much. Who doesn't? Who doesn't? Yeah, Who doesn't. <laughs> For real, uh, it, like, oh my god, that would be one way to make me f furious. To just yeah. be like, I don't like Dolly Parton. Like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> yeah. We also didn't talk about Scrooged with Bill Murray. Oh yeah, that's a thing. Yeah. Yeah. That is a thing. If there's any big fans of Scrooged out there, let us know. I I haven't not seen that movie since I was a kid. And barely Neither have I. It. So you guys uh, go to bat for it. Let me know. I think that's it. I think that's it. We love a Christmas Carol. We love ghost stories. Um, we love Christmas. Yeah. Not as much as Halloween. We are a Halloween podcast, but <laughs> ultimately big fans of the synthesis of Halloween and Christmas. That's a real, real lovely place synthesis. to to be synthesis. <laughs> uh let us know your thoughts on Christmas Carol, Charles Dickens, any of the many iterations, any thoughts you have on the ghosts or on Scrooge or or if there was any ghosts that really scared you, you know, if, if we're talking about ghost stories. Were there some as a kid or, or even last week that were like, oh, man, that was really scary. 
<laughs> Tell me about a ghost that spooked you last week. Let us know. Drop us a line. Hit us up. Happy Harvest Horror Show at gmail.com. Also on Instagram at Happy Harvest Horror Show. All right. We'll see you all next week. Bye.